This program is dedicated to those that paid for their lives at the hands of the state. Michigan Studios of WKTV. Let's go inside for Silent Voices. Hi, this is Sandy at WKTV Studios in Wyoming, Michigan. I'm here representing Silent Voices, and I have a couple guests for you today to meet. We have with you today Debbie Walker and Anita Sherrard. They're going to tell the horror stories that they have when their children were taken away from C uh, by CPS. We're going to start with... Um, Anita today. Anita, we want to welcome you to the studio today to tell your story. And you go ahead and you look in the camera right there and just tell your story as best as you can from beginning to end, okay? Okay, December the 29th of 2006, I, had, I gave birth to a, a um, newborn girl named Scott Richard. Uh, I was there for a second, then they took the baby, they had somebody watch me with the baby, and uh, because of my mental illness, they thought I couldn't take care of her. They called Perry Rex on me. They, the nurse came in the room and asked me that I want popping rice at Butterworth Special Health downtown, and she said I was going to give Sky Rich a ride popping rice, then they called Pine Rex on me and the guy took my child. Then they called CPS. Then, um, they took her from me. Then they had the CPS man named Jonathan Bates. He he went to uh, Spatch on to see how I was doing. He like said I was gonna pull my hair out and stuff, and I wasn't. Then he went to my mother's house. Um, they said he knocked at my mother's door, apartment, and he asked for me. And my sister didn't know who he was, so she. Then I answered the door, then she put, he put her through D.A. Blodgett, and straight after then I went to D.A. Blodgett, a lady named Carrie Smell, she had, had me think I was going to get my door, and she said, when I'm going to get the car seat, when I'm going to get clothes and milk for the baby, they never give it to me. And uh, she bought my door a ducky, and uh, she had built my house up. Uh, I deal with another lady named Claudia Tree Strong. She lied on me, said I wasn't having hygiene products at my apartment. And she told me if I get an apartment, they told me if I get an apartment, go to my uh, parenting class and go to my appointments, I would get my daughter back and it didn't never happen. Anita, I want to ask you a couple questions. Did you know before you gave birth to your baby that CPS was going to come to the hospital? No. What do you think triggered that? Just because they were watching you uh, interact with your no, child? They, they did me like that because I'm diagnosed with a mental illness, schizophrenia disorder. But they didn't tell you beforehand that there was going to be any problem with you giving birth to no. this child? No, they told me the baby was healthy and I was all right too. Okay. I was all right and they like and said, it's my illness that I have ever put no hell on anybody. So they told you because of oh your mental daughter. illness, when you were in the hospital after you had given birth, that they were going to take the child from you? Yeah. Yes, okay. They had told me before that they had me thinking I was going to take the baby home and somebody from Michigan they was going to come with me and I could raise the child by myself. That you could raise the child and take care of then the child? They, straight after that, they put me up, they lied and told me my mother brought, came, the second day after I had the baby, and she brought clothes for the baby. And straight after then, they said that, um, they told me that she, they told, they had, um, <coughs> Take your time. They had the, 
they took her from me and told me if I go to my parent class and parents and classes mm -hmm. that I would get her back. If I go to Forest Room, they took me to Forest Room and before I went to Forest Room, they like said I was walking around special health for the worst but naked. Oh, they told lies about you mm -hmm. and recorded. They said I was gonna get my door popping right now. I did not say it. I could even go downtown and take a light detector test. I did not say that. Mm -hmm. Okay. So how many years ago was this? Five years ago. Five years ago. December the 29th, 2006. Have you seen your child since then? No. You've never been given any mm -hmm. kind of right to see your child? I had parenting classes for a year, but they stopped it. They stopped the parenting classes? And they didn't even tell me when they were going to determine the right. But you didn't yes. have your child the first year. They took it at birth, right? Yeah, then straight after she got took and they gave me parenting rights, but it was just for a couple of months. Mm -hmm. Making you think you would get your baby yeah. back. Mm -hmm. They told me if I go to my appointment school or parenting class and take my meds, I would get her back. In the okay. There's always I meds have... involved, isn't there? Yes, yes. yes. You know, they want to put you on all kinds of yeah. meds. Yeah, I haven't ever done nothing to my door. You have what? I haven't ever done nothing to my door. You haven't ever done anything to your door? didn't want to do nothing to her. Yes. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to look in the camera, hon, and give your daughter a message right now. Just say something to your daughter. Skyra, I love you wherever you are. I hope you're looking. I, I hopefully wish if I can't have you, I could be able to get visitation rights and be in your life, Skyra. I know I miss you. I had dreams about you and stuff, and I believe it will happen one day we will meet again. That was very so nice. Wonderful. Very nice. Do you have hope of getting your child at all? Do you? Yeah. Was the case dismissed or is the case still, a case still pending? Pending. Still pending. And what are they making you do now? Nothing. Nothing. But the case is still pending. I can't see her. You no, can't see her I think at her all. case was no. Okay. Oh. It is, I haven't saw her like in three or four years. Okay. Okay. But they have not dismissed the case. Yeah, they did. They, oh, they terminated my rights. They terminated your rights totally and dismissed mm -hmm. the case. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what would you like to say to CPS workers? CPS workers, God gonna get y'all for what y'all are doing to us. Cause you just tearing up people's families, making families go against each other and y'all ain't right. Y'all need to see how it was, is if it was in y'all. If you was in that situation, you wouldn't like nobody taking your, your, uh, your child away from y'all either. And it's wrong and God gonna get y'all for that. Cause I didn't do nothing to my daughter. And it was wrong how y'all did me. And uh, y'all gonna have to pay for it one day. Amen. Amen. That was Amen. Great. Need it. Debbie, what oh. would you like to say to us today? Well, I would like to bring up my um, case. Uh, well, it's really not a case. Uh, back in 2005, um, me and the father got in conflict, which were took me to jail. Um, I was working through Dear Blodger with Amy Bernard. Uh, I went to jail on a Saturday. Um, the foster mother named Karen called Dear Blodger, which she talked to Amy Bernard um, and let her know that I was in jail. Um, Amy went over to my daughter's home picked up my son, didn't have a court order or a removal from the um, protective service to remove him out the home. Um, I'm still at jail at this time, but my daughter told me that she came over that Saturday, I mean that Sunday to pick up my son. Um, I got out of jail that Monday. Um, I called Amy Bernard, she had told me that she had removed him from the home. I said, why? She stated, because I was in jail. I said, but um, my daughter is 18 years old at the time. She can, you know, watch my son. At the time, he was a year old. Um, they took four or five days after I got out of jail to have court. I go to court, the protective service said they would not have removed my son out the home because he was in no danger. Um, after that, uh, Amy had me do a lot of guidelines, I mean, not guidelines, 
treatment plan. Debbie, may I stop you for a minute? Mm -hmm. Protective services told you what? That they would not have removed him out the home. But he CPS was not in did. no danger. But CPS but C did it anyway. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. Um, she gave me a, guy, a, a treatment plan. I completed the whole treatment plan that she had gave me. Um, my hair follicle was clean. My drops was clean. I mean, they couldn't have nothing on me whatsoever. And I kept asking Amy, what is it that you want me to do? What else do you want me to do? Um, I also put myself in these um, programs called Living Water, uh, Women of the Well. Um, I also had a case manager. Her name is Kim Staber of at Living Another Well, Women of the Well. Um, they also, when she had went to court with me, they didn't he want to hear nothing she had to say. As far as my treatment plan, um, my goals, they didn't have, they didn't want to hear anything. Um, I graduated through all the programs that they had me going through. I did relapse prevention, um, NA meetings, AA meetings. I mean, I gave her so many paper that they was like, wow, this girl did everything that y'all asked her to do, and you still going to take away your rights? Mm -hmm. I asked Amy Bernard, are you still going to take my rights? She said, yes. I said, why? Mm -hmm. She couldn't tell me why. I mean, I did everything they told me to do. Um, I'm still going through health problems right now because I have not seen my son since he was a year old. I have not seen the other son that um, Karen have, which he'll be um, eight years old in July. Um, it's How long really, has it been since you've seen these children? I have not seen the eight-year-old, the one I'm just talking about, Quasi, from birth. From birth, okay. But um, Isaiah which she changed their names. Um, Isaiah, I have not seen him since he was a year old. Okay. I mean, you know, they was having me having visitations and everything until they took my rights. So he was, a two, he was two years old when they um, terminate my rights. Okay. So if two and children, you're not allowed to see you have any nope. visitation. And all I asked Karen, I wrote Karen a letter. Amy Bernard, I talked to Amy Bernard on the phone. I said, Amy, is it okay if I write Karen a letter. She was like, sure. So I wrote Karen a letter stating that I know that they grow up with you. I don't want to take them out your life. Um, just give me visitation or send me some pictures. She said she didn't want to do anything either. Has she so adopted the children? I think she have adopted them out. Mm -hmm. And all I ask is let me see, see them or um, send me some pictures. Let me grow with the pictures. I, I don't want to take them from you because I know that they grow with you. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm s still alive. Just let me, you know, have visitation. That's all I ask. Mm -hmm. but Debbie, why don't you look in the camera and say something okay. to your children? And then I want you to say something to the caseworker that did you wrong. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kwasi and Isaiah, I love you both. I always wanted, you know, to have you in my arms, you know, and um, I pray about you each and every day. I can't, sometimes I, I dream, you know, that you right there in the home with me, and um, I miss you so much. I know that, you know, I did wrong by me going to jail, but they, the protective service wouldn't even took them out the home, but you know, I still love you, I care for you. Someday we will meet again. I love you. And for um, Amy Bernard, you was wrong. You gave me hope. Um, you told me to do everything you wanted me to do, and you still terminate my rights. And I really think that was wrong of you to do. Um, I think you took the job over your head. I think it was a partner thing between you and Karen. Because if it wasn't, you would have considered has given me a second chance, and that's all I ask. And you still took my rights. Okay, what else do you have to say about what happened to your case? Um, well, because what I'm finding, Deb and uh, Anita, is that all these parents that we are interviewing, 
um, the same thing happened. You know, they had no rights. They're not given the parents any rights at all. They're just taking them like they're God. I call them demons, the yeah. demon from CPS. Um, it's a big entity that has turned into a demonic force in the nation and in the world. Um, the, I showed, told on another program that we did earlier today, statistically, children uh, get killed five times more in foster care than they actually do in the own parent's house. Yeah. And uh, that's very sad because we're selling children. We're selling children for money. We're selling children um, to be taken away from the biological parents and be given to other um, a lot of foster parents that don't even want to be foster parents. Right, right. They're doing it for the money themselves mm -hmm. so they don't have to go to work and have a job. I'm sure there are some that love the children, but mm -hmm. um, it's causing a lot of confusion in homes. It's causing yes, a lot of frustration in homes. And we need to have this stopped. Mm -hmm. We need to stop this demon that has grown bigger and bigger mm -hmm. uh, in this state of Michigan and in this nation. And so CPS, as I'm talking, and I'll continue talking with these two ladies, yeah. um, you, need to, you need to respect parents more. You need to change the way you're handling these cases because what you're doing is tearing families apart instead of keeping families together. And you don't even care uh, that you're tearing families apart. All you care about is the paycheck that you That's get on right. Friday afternoons. I was involved in uh, CPS myself with a grandchild, so I know. That's why I got involved with Silent Voices. It is Silent Voices that the children are not being able to say anything. They're no. being ripped out of homes, yeah. and they have no voices. They have nothing to say. They're getting put in foster care. Mm -hmm. um, children get put in foster care. They don't know what's going on. They don't know who's hurting them. That's they right. stay in bed at night and wonder and have nightmares what's going on because they're not with mom and dad anymore. Yeah. Anita, do you have anything else you'd like to say about your yeah, case? Claudia, she told me, she told me that her mom used to be caseworker. She said she wrote on my baby and the family and her, and she tried to adopt her and they denied her. They denied your aunt from adopting her. What was the reason? Uh, they didn't have no reason at all. They didn't have a reason. They, they just didn't want me to get closer to her. Yeah, they didn't want you to be around her, so they didn't let a relative. And plus, Claudia Tree Strong said I can never take care of a baby because I'm mentally ill. Mm -hmm. because and I think believe if I it. take my medication, I could be able to take care of her. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Amen. Okay. Anything else? Uh, <laughs> she just built my house up. She built your house up. Yes. I got a witness at, uh, where I go get my medication and that she said she won't the baby to be in the family and she lied about And he'd have a question for you. Were you on medication before you gave birth to the baby? Yes, yeah, since I was fifteen mm -hmm. years old. Okay. You were fifteen? Sixteen. Sixteen years old and you were on medication. Yes. Yeah. Why did you go on medication? Uh, because I was having problems with mental illness. With mental illness and so they put you on medication. Yeah. And then you became pregnant and um they they decided they decided that you weren't a good parent. Yeah. Okay. Deb, how about you? Um, I do want to talk about the, the, uh, about the drugs. Now, I was on drugs for 20-some years, and when they, um, they gave me 12 months sobriety. And the time that they took my son, I was clean. And they said that the reason why they took him is because I relapsed. Well, my uh, drug of choice is crack cocaine, not alcohol. Mm -hmm. So when the man, my um, boyfriend had, the baby dad got into it, a fight, <clears throat> they said that I was drunk, which I had some um, punch at the party. I didn't know it was spike, so that's why they said I relapsed. But um, when I had my witness up on the stand, they said they didn't want to hear anything they had to say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So because they wanted to nail you for what they yeah. wanted to nail you for. Because mm -hmm. of my back, my back pass of using mm -hmm. drugs. They don't want to forgive. So mm -hmm. I mean, it's just. Did they want to put you on other medication, their mm -hmm. their own drugs? No, they okay. couldn't. That's why they took my hair follicle. That okay. came back clean. That's why I was saying they didn't find anything on me. My urine test, everything mm -hmm. was clean. Okay, everything was clean. Mm -hmm. All right. Anything else? Nope. 
It was wrong how they did me. No, they even said I paused that I was reading. Her. Mm-hmm. And that wasn't true. I'm not so mm-hmm. Amen. Amen. You're a very sweet woman. <laughs> and I believe you're capable of raising your yeah. child. Thank you know, it's wrong for the state to come in and tell what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. We are the parents of the children that we give birth to. Mm-hmm. We have the right to raise that child the way we want to. Yes, if a child's being abused uh, and beaten every day, then yes, that child needs to be taken out of the home. But if that child has a parent that the state thinks is not up to their standards, Mm -hmm. they have no business taking these children. They have no business coming into the homes, checking for cleanliness, checking for if there's enough food in the refrigerator, checking to see where you're taking them, what you're doing with them, whether you have boxes sitting around in your home, whether you have boxes in your shed. It is none of their business. They should be out taking children from homes where children really are being abused and not being fed. That's right. That's right. Okay. Well, thank you so much for coming on with us today. Um, We want to thank the listening audience. We are having a rally in August. I believe that's August 17th um, downtown in Grand Rapids. We want you all to come to that rally Mm -hmm. so that we can let the state State know. We we mean business. Oh, yeah. We're not joking around. We we mean business, CPS. We mean business. You're taking children that you have no right to take. You're destroying homes. You're causing confusion and corruption in homes, and it's time that you stop. So this is Sandy at Silent Voices at WKTV in Wyoming. And we're going to say to our listening audience, ladies, you you can can make make a a difference. difference. God bless you and good night. Welcome to another Citizen Mass Outrage Commentary. I'm Sally Borghese, and in this commentary, I will discuss court-appointed special advocates, or what is referred to as a CASA volunteer. According to the National CASA Office, to be a CASA volunteer does not require any special education or background. CASAs must, however, pass a background check and participate in a 30-hour pre-service training course and agree to stay with a case until it is closed. A CASA volunteer is appointed by the judge, assigned to hear the case when a child is removed from parental care. In the job description of a CASA on the National CASA website, it is stated that volunteers get to know the child and talk with everyone in the child's life. That would be parents and relatives, foster parents, teachers, medical professionals, attorneys, social social workers, and others. It is also stated that they use the information they gather to inform judges and professionals involved in the case of what the child needs and what will be the best permanent home for the child. Now let's evaluate the requirements of a CASA volunteer and their job description. First, there are always Child Protective Service caseworkers who have degrees in social work that are handling the case from the day a child is removed from their home. So why would there be a need to have another person doing the same work as the caseworker, especially someone that has no education or background in social work or psychology and someone who only gets 30 hours of training? Originally, it was thought that a CASA was the voice of the child to the judge. This would seem to be a good idea, that a child could speak their mind to someone unrelated to the case, and that information 
would then be delivered to the judge. After all, the judge in most cases does not see the child during the case, except under certain circumstances. But often, the child finds themselves nervous and timid in that situation. So to have a confidence, so to speak, that the child trusts with their innermost feelings would be a great idea for bringing the child's real wishes to the judge. But in most cases, that's not what is taking place. CASAs are interviewing people in the case and providing courtroom testimony regarding those involved in a case. CASAs are even, bringing, are, are even being directly asked by judges what the outcome of the case should be. In other words, what is the CASA's recommendation for the child's life? In speaking with many parents and relatives of children who have gone through the Child Protective Service and Family Court, we have learned that the CASA volunteer does not seem to have a differing opinion from the caseworker opinion. It is also not understood why CASAs have a close relationship with the caseworker during the case. It appears as though the caseworkers are informing the CASAs of their opinions on the case. In previous commentary, we have explained that in many cases, caseworkers have an ulterior motive for not returning a child to the biological parents. That, of course, being the federal funding from Social Security that is received for each child brought into the system and not returned to their parents. So what is the purpose of a CASA? That is a question without a found answer. A CASA receives no comp compensation for their time and effort put forth towards a case, and all expenses are their own. However, the directors of each of the 1,000 or so CASA programs around the nation and those within the national office itself are compensated for their work. The federal government, through the Office of Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention, is the main provider of for the funding, along with countless well-known companies and individuals who also donate to the program. When reading over the National CASA website, it gives a person a feeling of a wonderful program that assists children in a troubled time during their lives. Surely there must be some children who have had a CASA come into their life who truly want a good outcome for the child's life and work diligently to make that happen. But when we have seen a CASA work to return a child to a family because it is the best outcome for the child. We have also seen and heard of those same CASAs being discriminated against by their directors. The most comprehensive study ever done on the CASA program was commissioned by the National CASA Association itself. According to the National Co Coalition for Child Protection Reform, that study found the program's only real accomplishments are to prolong foster care and reduce that chance that the children will be returned to their relatives instead of strangers and with no improvement in child safety. According to the National Coalition for Child Protection Reform, the NCCPR, the National CASA Association has removed this study from their website. However, the NCCPR has made the study available on their website. So you be the evaluator of what the purpose of the CASA program truly is. We have yet to figure that out. Thank you for listening to this commentary by Citizen Mass Outrage.